Andy Leachman from Leachman Cattle of Colorado. We're located in Fort Collins, Colorado, and this is our pre-sale webinar. We always host it a week before the sale, put it up online, it'll be recorded. If you don't get to stay for the whole presentation, you can come back and view it again. You'll be able to find it on Facebook, also on YouTube, on the Leachman channel, and also on the Superior channel. So tonight on the program, we're gonna have four different presentations. I have three guests, actually four guests with us, three different presentations. Um, first of all, Doug Lamblom from is with us from North Dakota. Uh, say that again, North Dakota State University at the Dickinson Research Extension Center. And he's gonna be talking to us about inputs and how to optimize them. Then we're gonna have Carolyn Wild and Nathan Clackham who are with us from uh, King Ranch Institute for Ranch Management. And they've been studying the, uh, the way uh, cow lifetime calf production relates to profit. Then Craig Hayes, who's our uh, bull division manager, is gonna talk to us about using the different rating systems to optimize your selection. I think today there's so much data, it's, it's hard to know what to select for, and then it's hard to know how to select for it. And that's really what it's gonna be about tonight. It'll be great if you're a commercial cow-calf producer, whether you're just getting started or you're an old pro, I think you'll pick up some things today. Some of these things will really ring true to you. And then, and then talking about how you make them better within your operation is really what it's all about. We want to we want to help you focus on the right things to improve your bottom line within your operation. So without much further ado, I'll, I'll let them get started. And then at the end of the presentation, I'll wrap it up um, with, a, with a, just a little wrap up on our upcoming sale. And certainly if you have any questions and you type them in, we've got people out there viewing these uh, different vehicles. If, if you're in live, if you, if you type them into the, to the recorded video, sorry, we're not still there listening. But uh, anyway, this will be about a two hour presentation and certainly do encourage you, especially on Facebook, to type in any questions you might have. So we're going to kick it off here. And the first speaker will be Doug Landblom from uh, North Dakota State University. Doug, thanks for joining us tonight. You're on mute, but if you click that, we should be off and running. Okay, I need to get my, uh, my feed up here. So I don't know exactly how we're going to do that. Um, where are we at here in order to get this thing up and running? If you wave your mouse at the bottom, there should be a share button pop up, and then you can share the screen that your presentation is in or the, the application. Nothing's coming up. Uh, uh, but you maybe go with your mouse to the top then, Doug? Should be a, a, a Zoom window. My Zoom window pops up at the bottom, and when I put my mouse right at the bottom of the screen, I get a whole row of things. One says mute, stop video, participants. Yeah, I don't have I don't have any of that stuff. Uh, let's see. I don't know what to do. I it don't should have be any the, of it. Nothing is up. Yeah. I just have the big worm zoom in the middle of my, in the middle of my. Uh, okay, you have the upper right box in the corner where you can minimize your window, and then the then the controls should pop up again. It's just the, that menu for zoom pops up and pops down. Okay, I see you and I see myself. So let's see. Uh, then, then there's an arrow in the upper right. Maximize that. Arrow, blue arrow. Yeah, hit that. Did it make it big? No. Now I see you again. View should be should be at the bottom. There should be a little pop up menu of your screen with a green arrow up to the upper right. Exit, exit, minimize view. That green arrow is not here. Son of a gun. Huh. Let's see. Uh, more? Sure. Invite, raise hand. You know, one share thing we could screen, do. Share screen. Yeah, share screen. That's it. Let's try that one. Okay, here we go. Let's see if awesome. this works. Well, we'll see. We ain't there yet. I bet. I'm, I'm optimistic. Uh, come on now. Okay, share. Perfect. We got it. You're in. Now you can, let's see. I can see a screen with a title and green sides. So we're, we're good to go. Okay, you got, you got all of that? Okay. Yep. 
Well, Thank sorry you. for the sorry for the delay, but here we are. Uh, are we live, ready to go? Okay. My name is Doug Landblum. As uh, Lee said, um, I am a beef cattle specialist at North Dakota State University. Have spent a career, a fairly long career, uh, working with uh, predominantly beef cattle, but some with hogs and even horses. So I uh, got a varied uh, career, varied a uh, lot of experience. But anyway, at this point in time, let's uh, let's just move along and see if we can uh, uh, let's see advance this thing. Yeah, there we go. I want to talk this evening about profit drivers in the beef cattle enterprise. And the first, I've got four drivers that we're going to talk about this evening. And the first one is uh, basically grazing versus harvested feeds. And as we do that, the slide I've got up here right now talks about gestating and lactating cows and dry matter requirements. And I'm using in this particular situation for our uh, Western North Dakota semi-arid environment where 25 pounds of milk is is about what we want. So with that in mind, I've taken, I've got on a, a chart here, some uh, both gestation, dry matter requirements in the last third of pregnancy, and then those requirements for a lactating cow in that first 90 days of after calving. And uh, I've got a 1200 pound cow through a 1500 pound cow, and we have some heavier ones out here than that. But let's just focus where those yellow circles are. Let's look at the, uh, at those blue bars are our gestation, uh, TDN requirements, uh, or the pounds of feed required in dry matter. Uh, and our green bars are lactation. And you can see that 1300 pound cow has a 25 pound dry matter requirement in gestation up to 28 pounds, doesn't move quite as much. But our lactating cow that has a, a TDN requirement of about 59%, about 5% over that of the gestating cow. And you can see we're at 34 pounds for a 1300 pound cow and 38 pounds for our 1500 pound cow. I'd like to move forward and look, take a look at a, uh, a little bit of math here for you. And um, when we talk about the Northern Great Plains region where I'm located and, and we're gonna talk a little bit here about carrying capacity, uh, looking at that 1300 pound cow versus a 1500 pound cow, and when we do this kind of math, we use our reference cow as the uh, for one animal unit, and that's a thousand pound cow with a, up to a six month old calf. Over here, I've got a yellow box on the left hand of your screen on this chart. And uh, up here in this country, compared to Texas, which takes a lot of ground, we take around two and a half acres per animal unit month, which is uh, which is really excellent. I've got a section of land here of native pasture. So let's take a look at what we can do in terms of carrying capacity comparing these two body weight cows. And in that core, in that section of land and two and a half acres per AUM, we've got 256 animal units in that section. In this first column where we see cow weight, uh, we've got our reference cow, our thousand pound cow, has a metabolic weight raised to the, that uh, live weight raised to the three fourths power of 177.8. A 1300 pound cow is 216.5, and a 1500 pound cow, as you can imagine, gets heavier at 241 pounds. So if we take each of those cow weights and we divide them by our thousand pound reference cow, <clears throat> you can see that our animal unit equivalent. For a 1300 pound cow is 1.217 compared to 1.3155 for our heavier 1500 pound cow. So we look at carrying capacity, divide that uh, uh, unit, animal unit equivalent into the amount of acres that we have in that section of land. And we see we've got carrying capacity there of 210 cows of the lighter weight cows compared to 188.9 of our heavy 1,300, 1500 pound cows. If we carry that a little fat further, we can see that we have about an 11.32% increase in the number of cows we can carry on that piece of property. And that equates to about 21.4 more 1,300 pound cows. If we take that one step further and we look at the calves that are produced from those additional cows we can carry on that land, that we were talking about a little bit early before the program, 
if we say we've got a 90.5% weaning of those calves, we're gonna have about 19 of those 21 calves available for sale. Uh, just for happen, for instance, we've used uh, 10 steers and nine heifers, 568 pound steers and 494 pound heifers. Uh, that works our way down to an additional amount of revenue of 22,253 from that additional number of cows that we can carry on that on that uh, piece of range. And so we see that it is advantageous to us in terms of a profit driver to reduce the body weight size of the cows on a given range carrying capacity. We take that one step further in looking at methods or uh, ways to control mature cow size and weight. Mature cow size is a function of frame size and mature cow weight. EPDs for maternal weight and uh, maternal height are really important and they have a direct effect on replacement heifer subsequent mature weight. So we want to take a look at that. We need to use the correct index. Dollars M index in the Angus uh, in the Angus breed is a maternal egg index and it includes things such as calving ease direct, calving ease maternal, weaning weight, milk, heifer pregnancy, docility, mature weight, of course, claw set foot angle, and mature height. And there's a uh, ample extra heavy emphasis on reducing mature height. If we look at dollars B as a terminal index and often gets used incorrectly in heifer selecting for heifer breeding. Uh, terminal B places heavy emphasis on weaning weight, yearling weight, carcass weight, marbling ribeye fat and residual average daily gain. And in yellow I've placed if retaining heifers for a replacement, selecting sires based on dollar B on the dollar B index is basically the wrong index to use for selection of replacement heifers. Dollar C is a combined value index and blends maternal and terminal indexes and puts restrictions on mature weight, but it considers 14 different traits that are really not in line with replacement heifers such as feeder cattle growth, quality grade, and carcass. Looking at uh, forages and feed and winter feed and the cost of feeds, harvested feeds, of course, by our red plus dollar sign are more expensive, increasing the cost of maintaining these cows year round as compared to two types of grazing, be either be summer grazing on native pasture or winter grazing on stockpiled forages or residues. So let's look into that a little bit. We've done some research up here where we looked at extending the grazing season using either a cover crop mix, corn and sunflower residues. And you see the pictures here of sunflowers, cows grazing, sunflowers, et cetera. And then another group of cows that we compared to and that was stockpiled name tame pastures and corn stock residues. And you can see the pastures here. You can see a lot of snow, and that's what we got in this country. And right today, I think we got 84 inches of snow racked up so far this season. So the snow we got in November, we're still looking at, only it's on the bottom of the pile in some places, three, four inch, three or four feet deep where we've been piling this stuff. If we take a look at a comparison of these winter feeding methods, we've got a, a dry lot control and then the, the crops that I just uh, described, whether it be corn and flowers and cover crops or stockpile grasses and corn residue. In this particular slide, I, uh, we had a two year study up there on owned land, uh, 48 cows per treatment. We fed those cows two pounds of 32% of crude protein cake. Hay costs in this case, I use $65 a ton. And right now I think it's about 150. Uh, our breeding started August 10th for May, June calving and all of those farming costs uh, in those annual forages were charged to the first enterprise. This is just a little look at the mix of that cover crop mix. We included sunflowers and, and oat crop, uh, winter fee, uh, a couple of legumes, winter, uh, a winter pea and a hairy vetch, uh, a forage rape, an Ethiopian cabbage, and a 100 leaf turnip. And you can see here in the picture of those different kinds of crops down in this canopy. And uh, sunflower once in a while, cows really like sunflowers. If you can grow those in wherever you're at. Uh, I know this uh, particular talk is gonna reach a lot of people from a, a wide area, maybe even overseas for all we know. 
But at any rate, our cows did not in the control group. Our dry lot cows didn't do any grazing. Uh, cows in the cover crop in the corn and sunflower residue grazed about 73 days. And our grass and residue, grass and corn residue cows grazed for 107 days. If we look at the amount of hay that each of those cow groups consumed, uh, our control cows uh, consumed 4,724 pounds compared to our uh, corn and residue, our cover crop and residue cows, 1824. And those cows that graze that stockpile grass and corn residue, 891 pounds of hay. What are those hay costs? Now, again, these are not the costs that were used in uh, today's hay prices, but it gives us the relationship uh, regardless of the hay, hay cost. So those control cows consumed about $173 worth of hay. Our uh, cover crop and corn and sunflower residue cows 68 pounds, uh, $68 in our grass and stockpiled residue cows down around $30. If we add all of the expenses, the supplement, uh, some taxes for land, et cetera, our total winter feed costs range from $209 per cow down to $73 per cow. We look at cow weight gains. Those cows that were in this study range from 1,470 pounds to 1,500 pounds. Uh, those uh, dry lot cows picked up 205 pounds and our uh, middle of the road cover crop in corn and sunflower cows gained 146 pounds and our, our uh, grass and residue cows 112 pounds. They basically held their own and about this weight is basically about the weight of fetus and fluids. So if we look at that body condition score change, you can see that we had gains from eight tenths to a pound and a half a day in our dry lot of cows. Uh, body condition score against those grass and corn residue cows didn't change much from 5.4 to 5.4. And yet our, our cows that had a little better quality feed, their body condition scores here range between 6.3 and 6.5. So it basically they put on 0.7 to point, about 0.8 condition score with basically no change in then those grass and, and corn residue cows. If we look at the breeding cycle calving percentages, you can see that our dry lot cows uh, had the highest first cycle calving and the grass and corn residue cows had the lowest first cycle calving percentage. And that was offset by the second cycle where our uh, two uh, uh, extended grazing cow groups uh, came in at 20.8 for our grass and residue compared to our uh, cover crop corn and sunflower residue cows. Uh, there were, if you keep an eye on that green bar as we look across this particular chart, that third cycle had the lowest number of uh, third cycle cows in that cover crop and, and uh, residue. And the percent open was about half of that of the other two cow groups, which is kind of interesting. And the total pregnancy, total percent of cows calving was greatest, 95.2% of those cows calving in the cover crop and residue group as compared to our control cows and dry lot and the grass cows were identical, which is kind of an interesting set of data. And I think what's going on here from what I can tell is that obviously we were able to uh, do a good job with those cows grazing grass and, and corn residue along with supplementation. And we've, we've known about these things for years because there's a lot of energy in that residue that uh, as long as we can maintain the, the um, rumen organisms and keep them well fed, we're able to, to uh, take advantage of lower quality forages. But this group in the uh, in the green bar, that group of cows, I think what happened here is in that in those residues, there's some very good forage, good quality feed in sunflower residue. Uh, the, the seeds that might fly through that combine are high on oil as well as the back of those heads, that pulp. And it, basically, sunflower residue is is a, a very good quality feed, and it it's evident here in in this. Uh, in this uh, total percent calving rate for that set of cows. Looking at the next profit, uh, prob profitability driver is calving ease and looking at early and late calving. And, 
And really, this is a very controversial issue, and people are comfortable with one method or the other. But let's just take a little bit uh, look at that calving date based on some of the work here at Dickinson. Our May-June calving uh, cows, we find that by calving them later in the season that we have a better match with the third trimester feed requirement, and we can take advantage of those lower quality forage forages, uh, grazing cover crops and the stockpiled grasses and, and the annual forages on cropland. Some of the other advantages are that we need less facilities. The calves, those cows calve with less calving difficulty. We have reduced labor and handling, and we find that our farmers that are doing this if they're farming, they can continue to farming, check it on those cows morning and evening. And we even take advantage of an early start to haying because we don't have as much problem with uh, handling these cattle and reducing things. The other thing that's important when we're grazing on cropland is the manure and urines that are dropped and left in the field uh, really contribute to increasing soil quality. Just take a look at this particular chart comparing May, April, March, April with May, June, and we get down to, uh, you know, we're starting that third trimester, December 12th in the April, March and April, and, and February 12th in May, June. It just gives us a little more time, as we talked about, to be able to feed lower quality forages and reduce that cost of winter feeding. We could pop over to this other chart and see most of these other things are quite identical between the two, but take a look here at calf death loss was lower in the May-June cows and the number of cows weaning calves was greater than the in May-June than there was in March-April with less, uh, less attendance, less surveillance, less pulling, less of everything as those calves, uh, uh, cow, cows calving in sync with nature really do better without a lot of additional human intervention. If we look at the next profit driver, it's crossbreeding. And of course, that's something that Lee is, uh, very heavily involved in his in his breeding and uh, and in his business. And as we look at crossbreeding, when it's done correctly, can have a significant impact on profitability. And of course, we're talking about profitability here. Using a sy systematic plan, crossbreeding exhibits hybrid vigor. We're all aware of that. And breeds that are more uh, genetically diverse and distinct will have a greater expression of hybrid vigor. And uh, Clay Center has uh, shown that very well in their research over a number of years. Of course, we got to have breed complementarity, where, we, where a weakness in one breed will be something that could be strengthened by a stronger trait expression in another breed. The greatest expression of heterosis in, in terms of cows and uh, mama cows is that that heterosis is better, mostly is more expressed in those low heritability traits particularly reproductive performance in the crossbred cow in such things as higher calving rate, greater calf survival, increased cow long time productivity and longevity, and then following up the increased weaning weight and post weaning gain. Those higher uh, heritability traits show a little bit less genetic, genetic expression in such things as feed efficiency and carcass quality. And straight bred cow herds can capture some hybrid vigor using composite sire breeds. And, and uh, Leo will get into that or others get into that uh, a lot more than I will. A big caution is that crossbred cow breeds must fit the environment and the feed resource because winters like we got right now here in North Dakota will separate them out uh, very quickly. This has been a tough winter up here. Then we'll look at our last profit driver, and that is uh, selling cull cows versus selling late bred cows. And uh, the longer we all know that the longer cow stays in the herd lowers the requirement for bred heifers. But we got a question. Do we manage cow for cow longevity or do we manage for cow salvage value? Something to consider. Old open thin cows are basically being sold at salvage value and yet are old older but not the oldest solid mouth cows some of those cows like that 79 year old cow have much higher value just in a recent sales of of uh, solid mouth cows here in dickinson on the 15th 14th of february those cows range from 1900 to 2400 dollars at the same time way up cows range from 87 cents to 99.50 per hundred weight 
we look at this particular chart, uh, we can see that those, uh, what I've got here is 1,100 pound cow, a 1,450 pound cow, and an 1,800 pound cow that sold here at the sale on the 14th. Those 1,100 pound cows bring just shy of $1,000. 1,450 pound cows bring 1,326. An 1,800 pound cow brings 1,631. If I take a look at that, and instead of selling those on, on a way up basis, if I look at them, compared the difference of selling those cows as though they were uh, bred cows and that solid mouth cow, take a look here at 1,100 pound cow. If we pace these cows basically at 2150, kind of the average between that 1900 and 2400 dollars we talked about earlier, we take a look at that 1100 pound cow could bring us 1153 dollars compared to about a thousand bucks. Our 1450 pound cow could bring us about uh, 823 dollars more than the uh, than what she would have as a as a cull cow. And that 1800 pound cow could bring us about $518 more. Of course, that big heavy cow does have a, a decent salvage value, but still, as a red cow, she'll bring $1800, $518 more. So there's something to look at. The other thing to consider in this cull cow thing is, is not to take out bulls. Leave bulls with cows instead of after a 60 day breeding season and managing bulls for the rest of their life. Uh, in other pastures and getting into trouble is to take those bulls and leave them with the cows and then using ultrasound and uh, and a combination of pregnancy fetal aging uh, go ahead and age those fetuses and select a cutoff date and those cows that are beyond your cutoff date for calving now they're bred cows there'll still be some open cows but a lot less of those bred cows then can be sold as bread cows and, and hit that bread cow market rather than selling them as open cull cows. And so that's something to consider when, when uh, taking a little bit different look in terms of a profit driver is to take a look at uh, the cull versus the solid mouth cow or the late bread cow uh, sold in cow sales uh, later on in the, in the early winter and midwinter timeframe. And with that, uh, this is a picture. I say thank you, and we'll probably maybe get some le questions later on. But what you're looking at is triticale and hairy vetch uh, hay crop that uh, has part of an integrated system that I'm working on. So thank you. Thank you, Doug. That was great. We appreciate that. Um, and uh, I'm sure we'll circle around. I wrote down several questions, but really oh, good no. stuff there. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> If you can unshare your screen, we'll uh, we'll let Carolyn Wild and uh, and sure uh, Nathan sure come up next and and share theirs. Yeah. So the next presentation we're going to have is is from the folks down at the uh, King Ranch Institute of Ranch Management, and they're going to be talking about relating lifetime calf production to cow profit opportunities. So Caroline and Nathan, thank you for joining us. I think it's probably warmer where you are in South Texas than where Doug is in North Dakota, but it's always good that we can bring a representation from all over the country. So thank you for joining us tonight. Absolutely. We're uh, glad to be here. Uh, as Lee said, we're students here at the King Ranch Institute for Ranch Management, um, earning the only, the only master's in ranch management available in the world. And um, as part of our coursework, we work with partner ranches, help them with analysis and, and things to help make better management decisions. And uh, Lee approached us last fall about this topic. Uh, we did a great project here that we're proud of. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to Caroline and let her uh, give a rundown of, of what we did here. Thanks, Nathan. So we related lifetime calf production to cow profit opportunity. And the reason that this is so important is because the Zoetis Fertility EPD that Lee just got to roll out is measured in the average number of calves that is produced per cow lifetime. 
And so we wanted to tie that to the profit opportunity that that cow then has during her lifetime so that this fertility EPD could be added into the dollar ranch and the dollar profit indices that um, Leachman's uses. This is important because it's going to allow producers to see how bulls with higher fertilities EPDs can impact their cow herd by producing daughters that both stay in the herd longer and also wean more calves. So our project approach was twofold. We first had to establish a relationship between what the average herd weaning percentage would be and then the average number of calves that a cow would produce in her lifetime. In order to do this, we made a couple of assumptions to get a data set. And the first one is we equated weaning percentage to retention percentage. So practically what this means is if a cow weans a calf, she stays in the herd. And if a cow doesn't wean a calf, she leaves the herd. Now, barring drought, we know that sometimes they're gonna call for feet issues or for disposition, but we went under the assumption that once you get your genetics and your disposition the way you want them to look like, this is a pretty good rule of thumb. And so to keep our data set pretty clean, this is an assumption that we went with. The other parameter that we put on this data is, is that after their 10th parity, which is their 10th pregnancy, so when they're 11 years old, all cows are going to be removed from the herd, just so that we had a nice round 10 numbers, 10 years for a number to divide things by. And as you'll see later, it was a surprise for us just how much the average age of that cow herd is going to fluctuate. So after we established that relationship, we're going to then calculate the marginal change in profit per the percentage change in weaning rate. And there's two really big factors that are going to drive this. And that's gonna be our annual cow cost and the retirement of our depreciation expense. So this table is gonna show us some assumed production cost and estimate revenues. And I know everyone's gonna look at this table and say, well, that's not my ranch. And I don't think anyone on here probably has all the numbers to match up, but we tried to pick stuff that was defensible for kind of an average operation. And remember that we're really looking at the trend line for this data. We're not so much looking at the individual numbers. So we used a capitalization cost of a heifer, whether you buy her or you raise her yourself of $1,500. And we put the salvage value of that cow once she enters your balance sheet and your depreciation schedule as $600, which is going to leave us uh, for $900 of total depreciation expense. We'll divide that over five years of useful life, which is the uh, IRS generally accepted uh, depreciation time for a cow. And that gives us an annual depreciation expense of $180. We used $170 per hundred weight for the sale price of a calf, a weaning weight of 500 pounds, and then an annual cow cost of $600. That annual cow cost is obviously not going to include depreciation because that's above, and it also doesn't return, uh, it does not include any returns to ownership that you may want to add in. So this table is going to show what we did first to relate the average weaning percentage to the number of calves produced per cow on average in a specific cow herd. This table shows for a weaning percentage of 86.9, which seems really random until we get to the bottom of the slide and you'll see why it makes sense. And so what this is gonna be equated to is if 100 heifers entered your herd the first year, we would assume that 86.9 of them are going to have calves. The reason we left the decimal places in is because this data is going to be used later on in a regression to add to the EPD. And so we wanted to make sure that we had all of the data in there. And so we could get the best representation of what's going on. So even though we know you can't have 0.9 of a calf, that's why the decimal places are in there. So the first year we'll have 86.9 calves produced and we'll have 13 cows that fall out because of non-production. And then those 86.9 cows that produced will move on to the next year. And then 86.9 of them will continue on. And so as you can see, we did this through 10 parodies, 10 pregnancies, which would be through cow age two to 11. And then at the end of those 10 years, we said that the rest of the cows are gonna fall out. So you can see here, we have a total of 100 cows that were productive for some amount of time during this 10 year period. And they produced an average or a total of 500 calves, which means that on average, we had five calves per cow. 
And the reason that this is important is because this ties back to our five year useful life that we saw in that previous slide. And it's gonna tie in even more when we hit our depreciation expense later on. So the reason we chose to show the 86.9% weaning rate is because it gives us that nice round number of five calves per cow. And then an interesting tidbit as well is that bottom line, it shows the average age of a cow in that herd is gonna be just over six and a half years. So this is a table that is going to show us the average age of the cow correlated with the percent weaned and then what the average number of calves per that cow's lifetime would be. So that's going to go from two calves all the way down at only a 67% weaning rate, all the way up to eight calves per cow lifetime on average for a 96% weaning rate. This table, this graph is probably familiar to a lot of you guys. Lee has this in his bull cell catalog, and this is a really cool representation of the average number of calves, which is what that fertility EPD is measured in compared to our weaning percentage. And this is what we're going to talk about, Craig's going to talk about later on when we get to the stars, that three average calves per cow lifetime is going to be that one star all the way up to the seven calves, which is our five star bulls. Here's just another representation of that data. It's sometimes nice to see it in two different formats. And this shows how as our average weaning percentage increases, the average number of calves per cow lifetime is gonna go up. And as you can see, the better it gets, the faster it gets better. The second part of our project was taking into account what the per profit opportunity would be for these cows once they're in the herd. And so the first thing we looked at was what happens just to the profit opportunity when she sells those cows compared to the cost that she incurs doing that. This table is a lot of numbers, but we'll walk through it. It's just showing what's happening at our different number of average calves per cow lifetime. So starting at two, going up all the way to eight. And we're going to start right in the middle at this five calves per cow lifetime, because that's going to be our baseline. So what we did here is we used a unit cost of production or UCOP in the table calculation to figure out what the actual cow cost would be, because normally we use cow cost to figure out how much each cow has to cover when she's in the herd. But in this case, we're actually only looking at cows that stay in our herd and produce a calf. And so those cows have to cover the cows that fall out without a productive calf. And so it's really important that rather than just using straight cow cost, we took into account those non-productive cows. So unit cost of production is measured, which is annual cow cost, and it's going to be divided by the weaning weight times the average weaning percentage. And so then we get kind of a more true cow cost. So as you can see, at our middle of the road, 86.9% weaning percentage, our true cow cost is actual $690 compared to that $600 that we looked at in the table before, because we're having to count for that 13.1% of cows that are falling out without covering their costs. What's really cool to see is, is by the time you get up to a 96% weaning rate, you're only at 625 compared to $600. And so you can get really close to that true average cow cost. And if anyone can get to 100% weaning rate and get that exact 600, we'd love that. And what's more scary is you look on the other end, each calf is having to cover $896 if you're only in a 67% weaning herd. And so it's, this really shows the value of it. We're starting to see the value already of what this longevity and fertility can, can play into. So then the next four columns are all going to be per cow lifetime. So this is the total cost of what that cow is gonna cost when she's in the herd. And then this is the total revenue that she receives from the calves that are sold. So when we're looking at our 67% weaning rate, she's actually taking a loss of $91 over her lifetime. She doesn't even cover her costs when she's in the herd. All the other weaning percentage, she will get profit, but we're gonna use our five calves per lifetime as an average so that we can then look at the marginal gain and loss because that five calves per lifetime is where we really wanna stay. So the last column on the right is gonna show the marginal gain or loss per profit over the cow's lifetime. And so if she weans three more calves than our base, so if she weans eight calves in her lifetime compared to five, she's actually gonna make over a thousand dollars more in her lifetime. And if she only means two calves, she's going to lose almost $900. The second part of our data set looking at the per profit opportunity looks at the depreciation expense. 
this is really important because this is even though it's a non-cash cost, it's a huge part of driving your profitability in your cow herd. So again, starting in the middle of the table, five calves per cow lifetime, we're gonna perfectly pay off our depreciation expense at $900. So she's not gonna receive a depreciation debit or credit. When she only produces two calves in her lifetime, she only covers $358 of her total depreciation expense which leaves $542 of depreciation for something else to cover. We call it a depreciation debit because it's either going to be a loss against your profit, another cow is going to have to cover it. She's not in the herd to cover that. On the flip side, if she means eight calves in her lifetime, she's going to have a depreciation of expense of almost $1,500. Now, we're not going to pay that $1,500, right? We're not going to pay more depreciation expense than what's on the books. So that means we get a $547 benefit or a depreciation credit that can go towards calves that didn't produce a cow. Sorry, cows that didn't produce a calf, or you can right, send it straight towards profit or variable costs, but it's extra money in your system. Our last table is going to be putting these two effects together, which is when we really are going to see the rubber meet the road. So if we look at our base and then our comparison kind of to our two extremes, if we have a cow that's only weaning two calves per lifetime, she is going to lose $1,430 over her lifetime or $719 per calf compared to a cow that can wean five calves in her lifetime, which would be in a herd with an 86.9% weaning rate. If we are in a herd with closer to a 96% weaning rate where she can wean eight calves in her lifetime, we're going to gain almost $1,600 from that cow or $194 per calf that she has. This is possibly the most powerful slide we can show you. And this is going to be how that profit skews from when she has few calves to a lot of calves. So if we have that two calves on the left-hand side, she's losing about $500 per calf, whereas on the right-hand side, over towards eight calves per cow, she's gaining almost $150 per calf. So in conclusion, we created this model to allow for a distribution of profit opportunity per cow lifetime, and we found this direct relationship between weaning percentage and the average number of calves produced per cow lifetime. This was really cool to see because it wasn't necessarily part of our data, but we saw the absolute necessity for a cow to produce five calves during her productive life because it allows for the complete retirement of that depreciation expense when she leaves the herd. And then, of course, most importantly, it allows for this fertility EPD to be incorporated into the dollar ranch and the dollar profit indices so that people can use it to help their bull batteries and their cow herds become more productive. Thanks, Lee. Caroline, every time I hear that, I take away a couple more things, and we sure appreciate you guys doing that hard work for it. We'll be honest, we got those numbers, and we looked at them, Craig and I and our team looked at them for about a year and a half, didn't we, Craig? And we shook our heads, and we're like, how, how are we going to calculate this? Caroline, if you could un unshare, we'll, we'll let Craig get up and share, but we looked at it for about a year and a half, and we figured out we couldn't calculate it. We made a whole bunch of guesses. <laughs> they weren't quite right. They were close. We we had a hard time, you know what you said at one point is it it's 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 better faster, and we had a hard time understanding how expensive it was to put bulls' daughters in the herd that don't achieve an above average number of calves, and and I think your analysis really pinpointed that, and uh, so boy we really appreciate that, Craig you probably want to share your presentation mode. You might grab the other window. It should be in one of the other windows. If you start before you share it, start your uh, PowerPoint into the presentation mode, and it'll pop up. And then you you are on mute too. But I always caution that it's hard to do three things at once. So, but but that's great presentation. That for both these presentations, I mean, we've really hit the nail on the head here with with cow costs and 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 the way to look at those cow costs and a way to optimize them using all the techniques that Doug spoke about. And, and then directly related to that, these, these two aren't really, they're, they're kind of flip sides of the same discussion in a way. One is to try to reduce that number of costs per cow, but then the other thing is to get the most out of those cows 
by having that productive number of calves in their lifetime and that higher calf crop percentage. And, and it's really a big, big driver. And I, I, we've been, we've been shocked um, by how, you know, th this, this inclusion, inclusion of this fertility EPD in our index is, was, it was like, it wasn't like a minor renovation on your house. It was like somebody drove a bulldozer through the house. We found bulls we were using that were bad. And we found bulls that we had stopped using that were good. And uh, we had to kind of retool. And so that was, that was, it was great. I mean, we're, we're happy we have it. And it's interesting. We have a whole group of breeders that work with us. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but they, um, they accepted radical change in a very short amount of time um, because they believe that this trade is so important. And it was because of the analysis you all had done. And so that's great. How you coming, Craig? So Lee, I'm having a little trouble when I go into presentation mode, finding my button like um, Doug had trouble when we started out. Yeah. So if you, um, one thing to do is once you go into presentation mode, then hit use your Windows button to get over to Zoom. Because you, otherwise you lose presentation mode. What happens when you go out of presentation mode? It goes out of presentation mode. So the only way to go out is to go with your windows and then bring up your Zoom window, and then you should be there. You go. Look at there. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. You ready for me to start? You bet. This is Craig right. Hayes. He's our director of the bull sales division at Leachman Cattle and has uh, got his own cow herd as well and is a, a, a master breeder and a student of the industry and selection. And he's going to talk about the challenge at using all these different numbers and, and how we can help make it a little simpler to use. Go ahead, Craig. Yeah, very good. Yeah. So we're going to try to take a simple co or, or complex um, issue here. and We're going to try to make it simple for you. I'm really um, a little bit on the other side of this. Um, a lot of times, um, Cody and I, were, uh, who's in the office here with us, we're putting together another catalog that goes out today. And um, <clears throat> so we were in the midst of the, all these stars and the complexity of that. So we're going to talk about how to be a star cattle breeder. And I guess, you know, I think I'm, I think I'm a lot like you guys are in that when, when I... Um, I'm sometimes overwhelmed by all the catalogs I get. And this is just a pictures of boxes, sale catalog, catalog boxes that we get and pick up a catalog. They're all different um, as we all are and, and, and rightfully should be. But, um, but do you ever just open up a catalog and wonder what in the world you're looking at or just get overwhelmed with how in the world am I going to, um, to handle any of this? Um, and to me, sometimes it's just like a lot of numbers just coming at me I'm overwhelmed, and um, and sometimes you have to ask the question, what in the world are we going to do? Um, so here at Leachman Cattle, to hopefully help you overcome that and help us in, in a lot of ways, because we use these stars as well, but um, we've implemented the star system to, to help you. And just in the last four, um, four years since I've been here, <clears throat> we've added more stars to the catalog, um, hopefully hopefully, um, decreasing the, con the, the complexity um, for you. <clears throat> so I think as you as you go through to, to, to utilize the star systems like like we have, you've got to ask some questions. And so what questions are you going to ask? You know, when, when, when selecting a herd bull to improve your herd, um, wh what do you need? So there's going to be stars floating around out there and you might get dizzy with some of them. You think you are. But what we're going to do is we're going to try to simplify that complexity um, and take the of all those numbers and make it make it simple here for us. So, yes, here here at Leachman Cattle, we do use data, and and the data does drive the stars. Um, we have EPDs in our catalog, just like all the other catalogs do. Um, we probably feel like we probably put fewer numbers in the catalog rather than more, and um, and we do that again to simplify the process. Um, if you've dealt with us before, if you ask a question about any EPD that's printed or not printed, we're going to share that information with you. So um, in the catalog, we hope not to overwhelm you, um, but hopefully give you pertinent information. And as you can see here, we've kind of got the basic EPDs of birth, weaning, and yearling. We have carcass EPDs. Um, we have information about um, mature, mature weight, um, yearling height, and then, of course, some um, efficiency um, EPDs and um, 
we have PATH EPDs that we use out here in the mountainous regions more so as well. Um, yes, we have indexes in our catalogs as well. They're found down here at the bottom in the red. Um, we have three main main indexes that we use, and, and Lee will talk about them probably a little bit here as we go along. I'm not really going to talk about the indexes per se tonight, but um, they are a driving force behind um, our system as well as our customer um, 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 exception and their ability to select, select animals as well. Um, but we use dollar profit, dollar ranch, and dollar feeder. And, um, and then what we're going to emphasize tonight will be the star systems. And I guess if you've followed our catalog, if you followed along with this, probably I didn't go back to no catalog and actually look, but we probably had four or five stars um, the last three years here in our catalogs. We've rearranged some things here this year. And, and we've bumped this up to nine stars or nine boxes that have, have stars associated with different traits or, or groups of traits, okay? And, and that's what I'm gonna spend time on tonight, walking you through and um, seeing how to use that. So if, so if you remember a few minutes ago, I asked you, I think as a, as a, as a, as a star cattle breeder, um, you've got to ask questions. What do I want? What am I selecting for in my herd? You know, I think a lot of a lot of times, a lot of a lot of our customers um, look at, you know, am I going to use this heifer or this bull on heifers? And I'm I'm going to hopefully kind of try to wow you um, from from a star standpoint with some pictures and some data. So um, I, I've picked out about four four bulls that are in our up and up and coming sale, and 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 hopefully they'll drive home a point here for for each of these questions that we're going to ask. So if you're going to look at look at this. Um, look at a bull that you're trying to select a bull to use on heifers. I mean, a lot of people might go directly to the EPDs and, and, and in this case, birth weight is the driving force behind calving ease that, that you would have on, on your heifers, um, but it's not the only factor. And I, I guess I, I made a comment here about, um, oh, two weeks ago that we just don't hear much feedback from our, from our customers about having calving difficulties. And I had one customer call me and said, I'm having trouble with my, with, with my bull's calving. and says, they're all out of negative birth weight bulls. But um, birth weight's not the only thing. And within our star system that we have, um, we have these cavernese stars. And it takes birth weight into account. It also takes a few other phenotypic um, measurements into account. And if you use our star system, um, like I said, um, you buy a four or five star bull, that you're, we virtually do not have calving difficulties in the commercial, the commercial cattle. So if you find a, a five star, and that's, that's the easiest calving calving animal that we would have. Um, those bulls are going to be the easiest, not only in our system, but also probably across the industry, okay? Um, if you select uh, a four-star calving ease bull, um, you could use this bull on, on smaller heifers with probably minimal assistance with those. And if you find a three-star animal, um, you could also use that on probably larger heifers and, and have minimal assistance or, or some assistance that might be associated with that. So if you ask the question, um, am I going to use my bull that I'm looking for on heifers? Then you would go to this, this calving ease star box that we've got highlighted in red, and that'd be your best way to get there. Um, in, this, in this up and coming sale here that we're having uh, a week from this coming Monday, uh, March 27th, there are 105 five-star calving ease bulls in the sale, and there also are many more four, four and three-star bulls as well. Okay, hey, Craig. Yes, sir. Can you go back one slide? I can. What if I buy one with no calving ease stars? Can I use him on heifers? Well, I was going to get that to, to, to a few moments. So, so um, this is the only box that you'll see up here that will be that could be devoid of stars in it. And Lee, I'm going to go one forward, okay? And this will um this will show that this calving ease box can be devoid of stars. And when you find that, that means he's not a three, he's not a four, he's not a five-star calving. He's, he, he's, he's a bull that you likely won't have um, trouble on your cows, but he is a bull that we do not suggest that you breed to heifers, okay? So that is the only box up here that you'll see that won't, um, won't have something below a three-star in it. We do that because we wanna make sure that you don't miss out and, um, and happen to select a bull that's not to be used on heifers. Lee, does that answer your question? Very good. All right. So, so we're moving along. I think another, another question that our bull customers ask or, 
Um, am I going to retain heifers out of, out of my herd sire that I'm, that I'm going out here to select? And, and if we are, we're gonna to try to make that simple for you. And we're gonna look um, here in these next three boxes. We've kind of, we've, at least we think systematically or hopefully um, in, in a way to ease you, we've kind of moved across here. We've got cavities first, we've got maternal in these next three boxes here. And um, maternal stars um, um, here, here on the left of these three, um, this is indicative of, of the maternal aspect of the bull. We also have cow fertility, which, um, which the, with people from King Ranch have talked to us about tonight, and I'm not going to go into, into in depth about that, but it is certainly a driving force behind all uh, behind our indexes. And then we also have udder that also plays a role in, in, in um, us coming up with this star system for overall maternal. Um, but we wanted to break that out for you for those individual traits more so, um, because some of you want to put more emphasis on one of those things or not. Um, and then the, the other place to just to kind of point out um, to help you pick these maternal bulls that you can use um, to re keep retain or retain heifers out of will be down here in this lower footnote. Um, this bull is a five star maternal specialist. So he's five stars um, up here in the maternal and that's how he gets this designation. You, you'll see some animals that have four and a half or five or four stars as well. But um, these are the, these are the cattle that they're going to be driving forces for you to um, improve the maternal aspects of your herd. Um, like like um, Doug talked about, they're going to be lower cow weights. They're going to be um, lower intakes, lower height, um, <clears throat> more fertility. And so when, when selecting those, and this is going to hold true for all of the traits, um, we'll have a five star, four star and three star designations and possibly two stars as well. Um, those are going to be best, better and good. Um, so if you're really wanting to improve your, your maternal aspects in this case, you're going to, you're going to select for a four or five star um, um, bull. And if you're not concerned about that, you could be really anywhere across the board. In this sale, um, this is kind of a hard mark to, 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 to make. Um, Lee, if we, um, if, to get this five star, they have to be five star ranch. They have to be five star fertility. They have to be five star udder. They've got to meet three demands. They've got to be in the upper echelon of everything, okay? And there's only 16 that are in this up and coming sale. There are five star maternal specialists in the sale. Um, I moved down into some four and a half star maternal bulls and there's 57 of those. So, so there's a nice selection of bulls if you really want to put emphasis on your cow herd for selecting or retaining ownership or retaining heifers in your herd. Um, the third question that, that I think, you know, you got to ask yourself is, are you going to retain the progeny through the feedlot? And, um, in doing that, um, we're going we're gonna to put emphasis here in these next two boxes, okay? Um, that's growth and that's feed to carcass. And um, the, those are going to put in um, post weaning gain, um, feed efficiency, um, grid, grid premiums. Um, those, are the, those are the traits that it's really going to be looking at. And so you can go up here into our EPD boxes and select for those individual EPDs. We've put that into a into a group of group of star systems, somewhat of an index for itself, and and, um, and we put a we put a lot behind this. We, we we gather a lot of data that that influence these things, but we also put a lot of, a lot behind this to making sure that when you're wanting to improve those different traits, whether it's growth or whether it's feed to carcass or whether it's your maternal aspects, that those bulls are ranked appropriately for you, and hopefully it's easy for you to find in the catalog. Um, and again, these these animals are going to be ranked on our on our star system four five three four five and stars good better and best. Um, and in the and in this star or in in this sale coming up, there's 185 bulls that are five star terminal bulls in the sale. Um, and probably not to get ahead of me, but ahead of myself. But um, you, you'll notice that this bull is a four and a half star all around bull. I don't have it marked as a terminal specialist, but we're going to talk here in a few minutes. And I just wanted to bring this out while we had him up here. He's actually a four-star maternal bull, and he's a five-star terminal bull. So that four plus five gives us 4.5, and that makes him a four-star all around. So he's he's good. This is lot 12 in our sale. He's good for maternal, and he's good for carcass, and that makes him an all-around. Um, I'm going to change gears just slightly to talk about our last section of stars. 
So um, many of you guys have seen some of our some of our testimonials in our catalog, but Lee and I evaluate each of these bulls individually. You can see in the in the picture here on the left, standing back behind Lee, we've got a pin of bull standing down in the alleyway. We pull all of these bulls out into an alley. Um, we bring them out one at a time. Um, we, we ask them to stand here in between Lee and I. This is a very docile bull. We score these bulls for multiple traits, about uh, eight to nine traits that we that we, we score them on. So it, it goes into the catalog, goes into our EPD system. We score them for disposition. We score them for motion or movement of those animals, how well or free they move. We score their feet for claw and angle shape and um, shape and size. We score an overall measurement on those bulls and eye appeal both go into our kind or, or phenotype um, evaluation to help you kind of know if you're unable to be with us, you know, what that bull looks like. And then we try to make as many comments on those bulls as we can. So if you call in um, for a sight unseen bid or to ask us questions, um, we are always happy to go out and look at those bulls for you, but we may have comments on them as well. So this is going to take me into the in, into the next slide and um, uh, these last three boxes here of our star of our star boxes. And then are you concerned in, when you're making your bull decision, are you concerned about feet, disposition and or phenotype, um, what that bull looks like overall appearance. OK, so in, in this case, I did pick out a bull that's a five star feet. So he's a he's a feet improver. If you have trouble with your cows, um, you know, out on the range and their toes are getting curly or they're they, um, getting too much angle or too less angle. Uh, too steep in their angle, um, you know, this, this bull should improve the feet or the claw shape of, this, uh, of your, your animals. Disposition is a, is a five star as well. That means you can virtually walk up to this animal out, to, out in the pen or when he's standing there in between Lee and, and almost touch him before he's going to move away from you. That's what a five star disposition bull is. And those are ranked for every, every half star down to about a, um, a two or two and a half. Um, th those cattle are, are, are have, have a much bigger flight range, um, um, and so, but they'll, but they'll be designated as that. And then phenotype is a five star. You can see, uh, you know, you know, for us when we evaluate this bull, he's not only kind of a, a deep body, really thick, expressively muscled bull, but he also has um, really nice balance. He straightens his lines, um, fairly clean front and fairly clean sheep. Okay, so that's what goes into our phenotypic stars. And it, um, um, again, that these are ranked in four, five, and threes, and and they and they are um, there are some two star bulls in here as well for these different traits as I as I mentioned. We're going to do talk about one final aspect of our stars. This is not in our boxes, but as I alluded to earlier, we had some all around specialists, we had some maternal specialists, and we had some terminal specialists that we talked about tonight. And I just want to draw your attention to that. Um, this comes directly out of our catalog. I'm sorry I didn't look back up and see what page that was, but we try to make bull buying easy for you. Okay. And in order to do that, we, um, you know, if you want to emphasize maternal traits, as we talked about, that's going to increase moderation of frame, um, moderation of cow size, fertility, um, longer lived cows, more pounds per acre, more fertility in those cows, as, as we talked about earlier tonight. If you're looking for to make put terminal um, terminal emphasis on your cattle, it's going to be a high gaining, heavy carcass weight cattle that convert better, and they hang a hang a higher grid value on the rail. Um, and those are in four and five star bulls. And then the balanced trade approach is bulls that combine both of these. Okay, um, if we get into in, into these cattle, they can be a, 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 a four and a half star bull could be a bull that's um, four on maternal and five on terminal, or it could be the flip, a five on maternal and a four on terminal. But um, that's one way that we're trying to make that. And just as an example of that, um, this is an all around bull. And that just really means that they really have more stars in, 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 in one aspect, um, maybe more concentrated just towards the maternal and, and the feeder. Okay, so this bull here is a five, a four and a half star all around bull. So he's got to be a four and a five on two traits, and that's a four star on maternal in this case, and a five star on feed and carcass. Okay, um, just to emphasize this and make sure you guys understand, when we say he's a four star um, maternal, um, he's going to um, that's going to the three traits that go into us developing this star system is dollar ranch, which is a number down here, the cow fertility of the animal, 
and the udder score of the animal. That's what, what gives this boy a, a, a this bull a four-star maternal rating. And then those two together give us the all-around rating. Okay. So if you buy a five-star um, all-around bull, this is an industry industry's highest standards for all traits that, that, that we record. And they're all kind of wrapped up into these, these two numbers, really, of these two star systems that we have here. Um, a four and a half, five star, as we've already mentioned, is a four or five star for either maternal or terminal. And a four star bull um, is a four star maternal and four star terminal aspect. In this sale, and, and Lee, I have not gone back and looked at this, but I, I, I kind of have kept up with this over the last year. And um, since we rolled this um, star system out, there are four or five star bulls um, in this sale. And I really think you would have a hard time getting much over 10 um, 10 five-star bulls in the last year. This is, this is a really high level um, high level for, for bulls to meet. Um, if you want an all-around bull, it, it is hard for them to get there. There's 564 bulls in the sale, and there's only five of them that meet that criteria. As we move down, there's 104 four-and-a-half-star all-around bulls in the sale. So again, just to reemphasize, um, if you're looking for one of these, um, a bull in one of these five categories, we try to make that easy for you to find. Um, you can not only call us and, and um, look at that, and, and we'll go, um, you also shared a, a um, Excel file on our, our internet for you, but we try to make this easy through our STAR system. And I just wanted to point out to you that you, you, you uh, we hope you guys would be able to call one of our reps and, um, and help, help we go through this scenario with them is what you're looking for. They should be able to help you get a short list for your, for, for your bulls when you're looking for bulls. Um, if you if you need help, and um, and then we're always welcome and happy to help you here in the office as well with our management team um, to help you do those same things. So um, that's going to end my presentation. Hope hope we've made it simple for you and haven't overwhelmed you too much tonight. But um, that's what we do here. So thank you guys. Thank you, Craig. That was fantastic. That was that's super good. Even animations, man. That was that was very cool. If and uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna dive into my deal and then, then we're gonna jump around. And if you're out there on Facebook and you're watching, please type your questions in because when we get done, we'll take some of those questions. And uh, if you guys are bashful, I'll have to come up with all the questions. The questions will be harder, but that's just the way it is. So uh, we have we have kind of a rallying cry at our company, and and our rallying cry is that the world loves exceptional beef. I mean, I think that's one of the great things about our industry is seeing people sit down and eat one of those best steaks because I think it's unique. It's one of the best eating experiences you can have, bar none. And we're just helping you produce it. We're just helping you get there. And uh, we really think that, that these indexes that drive these stars, that drive our selection. And if you ask us what, what Lee and Craig are looking for, we're finding bulls that are, that are high on profit and dollar ranch. And, and we believe that those indexes make the best cattle. And, and you'll see that that lot one bull that Craig was featuring, he, he's not quite the highest star bull in the book, but he, he's awful good looking on top of having a lot of stars. And that's how he got to be lot one. But that bull is a bull that we've collected hundreds of straws of semen on already and will be used heavily in our system. So what we're advocating that you select for is what we're selecting for. Um, and we think these indexes are the best tools out there to improve your coward. There are lots of indexes out there. Doug did a great job of describing probably the indexes that are most used, which are the indexes offered by the Angus Association. But I think ours are just a little bit different. And, and the biggest difference today is on that fertility side. And we, we made the changes to an index. If you were looking at our catalogs historically, you'll open up this book and say, wow, this all looks different. This looks different. These numbers are different from what they used to be. And, and we implemented a lot of change in December. And I'm just going to take a couple minutes to talk about what we did and we refocused it. I think we were focused before, but there were some things that were left on the outside and the industry's changing. And what's the biggest change out there? We, we saw it. If you watch the earlier presentations, both Doug's and Caroline's, you, you, they quoted cost figures and you looked at it and said, those aren't today's costs. The costs are way higher than that. I'm like, Doug, if I could find $65 a ton hay, I, I, if we could find $65 a ton corn stocks, we'd be happy. 
But, you know, it, it feeds expensive and it's gone up and we know we have inflation and we know cow cost is going up. And so we have to f f factor that into the index feed prices. Um, I don't think we're going to come back under six dollar corn. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we'll get back to five and a half at some point. But that drives the whole complex upwards in terms of cost. And and that's what's going on. And, and, and that's a reality. So we had to put that in the model. The other thing that's going on is marbling today is worth more than it's ever been worth. There's record large spreads between the value of a prime carcass and a choice carcass. Despite the fact that we had prime peak at about 19% of product last spring, I mean, we were producing a ton of prime. I think the annual average was about 12%. We produced more prime last year than any time in history and it was still sold at a record price. We're in the time of the year right now in early March when usually the choice select spread is almost zero. And I looked at it today on Cattlefax and it's $12 today. So marbling is paying a big premium because of eating quality. And, and, and you know, people say, well, maybe we're gonna make too much prime. We're gonna have too much prime. You shouldn't select for that. I don't agree with that. If you want Lee Leachman's opinion, which is it worth exactly what you paid for it because free here. But if you want my opinion, you should raise, you should try to raise prime beef. It's worth several hundred dollars more head. It takes high marbling EPDs to hit it. And I think the market for prime is still relatively untapped because we're hardly even exporting it. It's all being eaten here in the US. We quadrupled production. It's all being eaten here and we're selling it at a high price. I think there are people all over the world that would love that prime beef. And finally, you heard a lot about the fertility EPD. If you listen to Caroline's presentation, we knew this was the most important trait. Now we have the best, oh, typo, best tool ever to measure and improve fertility, which is that EPD, and we're putting it into the indexes. And this is all about big data, folks. I mean, this database has a million four hundred thousand animals in it. We're getting records. We, we share our genetic analysis with a number of other seed stock breeders. I'll show you that in a minute. But they're contributing over 30,000 animals a year that come into this database. And we're helping them improve their herds faster and their customers' for herds faster. And now these same tools, the same tools that we're using on our seed stock to find the best bulls you can use on your replacement heifers to pick the best replacement heifers all you have to do is call up Zoetis or call up Leachman or call up one of the other dollar, dollar profit users and say, hey, I want to test my heifers for these EPDs and indexes. And with a DNA test called Inherit Select, Zoetis can give you those individual predictions on your females. I'm telling you today, this is a game changer. This big data is going to help you pick better cows. And we combine forces with Zoetis. It's been almost five years ago now. I will tell you, we, we honored them last year at our spring sale. We give out a hairpin award to, to individuals and companies that have helped us substantially. No single thing we've done in my 30, 30 plus years in the business has helped us more than moving to a genomically enhanced prediction from Zoetis. And uh, now you can have that on your commercial heifers. You don't have to collect data. You just got to take a DNA sample to get it. It's amazing technology. Now, here's the group of breeders we're working with. And I'm not going to go through them all, but there's a, lot of, there's a lot of logos on that page, folks. Those are top breeders in their breeds who are selecting for profitability and turning data into the system. And that drives the accuracy of these EPDs and indexes, and it drives the accuracy of that inherit select. And uh, it's a tremendous tool. And I think you're just going to see it, it become more and more widespread. Um, it is a crossbreed platform. It allows you to crossbreed. It takes into account hybrid vigor. And it, and it looks at fertility. One of the reasons that we have a great fertility EPD from Zoetis, one of the reasons we're seeing huge differences in predictions is that this group of breeders keeps very good records.
And we don't just take data from everyone. We take data from them. That data goes in. That data drives those EPDs. And when we send those EPDs back out, you know who the toughest critics are of the system? It's those breeders. Those breeders are looking at those numbers and looking at their cows. And I can guarantee you, if they didn't think that lined up, we'd hear about it. <laughs> They'd be screaming and yelling at Craig first and, and then me. Um, and, and the reason is they want these numbers to be accurate and predictive. They want to make the most rapid change they can and the most rapid improvement they can. And, and this tool today is supercharged. I can, I can go through every logo on that list and give you a, a, a story, a testimonial of the strength and the belief they have that these indexes, these EPDs are really working. And, uh, and these people rely on them. And, and now we have a whole host of commercial customers who do the same thing. And uh, so what trait matters most? Look, if you're going to, and, and I mean, Craig didn't really beat on this drum, but, but there's not very many catalogs you can open up and find the trait that matters most, which is fertility. And, and if your cow herd, I, I think Caroline pointed it out super accurately, if your cow herd's at the low end of calf crop weaning percentage, the best strategy you can go do is go buy bulls that are four and five star in fertility. Buy the high fertility EPDs. Introduce crossbreeding, as Doug mentioned. Reduce your cow size. You're going to get a higher calf crop percentage. You're going to wean more pounds per acre. And then use the DNA to sort the heifers you're going to keep. You're going to have more calves and you're going to make more money. Let's face it, we're coming on to one of the best times in the history of the cattle business, provided that our friends across the oceans don't do something really goofy, which could happen. But, but we're coming on to a time where we have less cattle coming to market. And I think we're going to have record cattle high, record high cattle prices, record high feeder cattle prices. It's a time to get your ship in order. It's a time to use good bulls and build a great cow herd. You can afford to do it today, and it'll pay dividends for years to come. And the strategy is really simple. Craig talked about stars. You buy high fertility star bulls. You retain your highest dollar ranch and dollar profit cows that you DNA or replacements that you DNA tested. You're going to have more calves, and you're going to have more money. And uh, we've seen it work. Crossbreeding works as the IX Ranch Montana, 3,500 cows, pounds weaned per cow exposed, up 12% over a 10-year period. I went and met with them. They, they, have, a, they have a ranch kind of debrief every year. And uh, it, was, it was very fun. Well, these guys have uh, been using a lot of our bulls, have a lot of confidence in the program. Um, Shane said, look, it's all working. Our cows bred up 94%. Our two-year-olds bred up 90% in a year where we had three inches less than normal rain. And their calves weaned heavier. I mean, these guys are, are super happy. What are they doing? They're selecting for Dollar Ranch, Craig, that index that drives that profit at the from the birth to weaning, that dollar ranch number, we'll hit it again here in a minute, is what they've been selecting for. Another customer from South Dakota, Matt Jones, he was telling me this story. And I said, Matt, I got, I got to have to quote you on this. He's, he said, yeah, we were preg checking the other day. And, and he said, we got about three quarters of the way done. And I asked my wife, I said, have we had an open two-year-old yet? And they preg checked, I think, 97 wet twos. And three of them were open. I mean, that you know, we, we all dream about that. Why? Matt's AI, and he's using some of the really high five-star maternal bulls in our system. And those bulls are creating a really high rate of fertility within his herd on his young females, which we know is the is 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 the is the uh, you know the bellwether of the herd. And and part of that is using composites. We're big fans of composites. We've been using them for, been building them for 30 years. We have this, what we call a stabilizer. It's a blend of British and continental. We did that because we watched the Clay Center data. They said, if you're going to optimize cattle in the North American market, you need British and you need some continental. And then we've selected them for profit. And it's really changed the way they are. We find today that, that, that these are some of the best 
cows you can you can find and and the steers the steers are just wowing it um and and we won't emphasize the steer side of it tonight because i think for most of us in the cow calf sector we want to build a great herd of cows and you got to remember this maternal and terminal it's hard to get together i mean craig showed the superstars right they showed the athlete that can both be big and tall and run fast. We know that doesn't come together normally, right? Big and tall is usually like me or, or maybe Craig. He's a little bit faster than I am, but we're not near as fast as, as, as shorter is. And so there's some antagonisms going on in this cow herd. If you go after terminal traits, you lose maternal traits. And when we present those stars, you can see it. There's no, there's really no making a mistake at our sale. If you buy a high growth, high carcass bull, we show you where he ranks on maternal. And on average, they're going to rank a little lower. This because it's hard to get in one package. So we do produce these three indexes, Dollar Ranch, profit from birth through weaning. If you sell calves at weaning, you look at that number. It's right down here on this particular bull. It's 113. He's in the top 11%. That means that he, his cat, his daughters are going to produce $113 more profit a year than is a zero bull. That's Dollar Ranch, fertility, milk, growth, feed intake, hybrid vigor. Then we got the feeder number. The feeder number is measuring profit on the calves in the feedlot. We know this works. We've tested it on thousands of feedlot cattle. You get better conversion, more carcass value, and more carcass weight. It's a huge driver, again, measured in dollars per feeder calf that goes into the feedlot. And then Dollar Profit puts it all together. If you're retaining ownership and raising your own replacements, this number predicts your bottom line. The higher that number is, the more profit you're going to make on a bull's progeny. Our trend is upward. We're selecting for this. I always make the disclaimer. I got out of college in the late 1980s. And you can see, Craig, that for my first 10 years of managing selection in our database, I was not very good. Um, and then I started using an index in about 1996, and we started incorporating carcass data, and it started rising. And then we started with the more complicated dollar profit system in 2004. And then you can see where the genomics hit. The genomics is what's happening up here. And the same thing happened in dairy cattle, and the same thing happened in pigs, and the same thing happened in chickens. The genomics is really driving it. And, and I'll tell you, it's like driving a race car. If you don't hold on to the steering wheel, you go off the road and crash. And genomics will do that to you. And I would say before we had the fertility EPD, before we were doing phenotype stars, Craig, we, we were in, we were close to crashing a lot of times because when we select for the good stuff in cattle, unfortunately, bad stuff comes with it. Okay. I was with somebody today. He was talking about a new defect in one of the major breeds. And he said, look, he says in almost everything. So what he said, he said, he said that defect must have been associated with goodness, or it wouldn't have been in most of the cattle, but with the goodness came some badness, okay? And that's a good way to say it. Um, how fast are we moving? The average bull in our sale this year is better on dollar profit than the herd bulls we used three years ago. That's crazy, but that's what's happening. It's moving fast. I took time to compare what's going on. I think, and, and, and Doug didn't, Doug said he was going to get really... He's gonna he's gonna maybe offend some people. Maybe he did, but he 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 could have gone a step further. But but a lot of people are selecting for growth rate. If we look at the highest use bulls in the Angus breed, the ten highest use bulls, they're a hundred and these are the bulls that sired calves in the twenty twenty two calf crop. They're one hundred and thirty three on yearling EPD. They're they're big on cow size. They're big on feed intake. They're high on marbling and ribeye too, okay? But what's happening is people are chasing growth in kind, okay? And there's no hybrid vigor, putting Angus on Angus. And, and our EPD on, on those 10 bulls on fertility is a 1.1. And our 
bulls were using, they're, they're a little lower on growth rate. This is taking hybrid vigor into account. They're much higher on fertility and they're smaller on cow size and they have hybrid vigor. That results in, a, in an average higher calf crop percentage. When we look at the average indexes, it really shows the difference. Why? Because that fertility and cow size is a huge driver of profitability. No matter whether you own, I hear a lot of people say, well, I retain ownership. Fertility is not that important. I'm going to select for the carcass. Hey, we're doing the math. That's not right. You need to find high carcass animals that are good on fertility and still moderate cow size. And you can do that, but just it's more like threading a needle. And so when we got out to dollar profit, those 10 Angus sires, they averaged 13.3 compared to the 10 sires that were most used in our system that averaged 25. Why? We're about the same on feeder, 200, 215. Let's call that close enough for hand grenades. But on dollar ranch, the index driven by fertility, those top 10 Angus bulls average minus five. Two of those top 10 bulls are in the 99th percentile on fertility. They're two of the worst bulls in our entire database on fertility. Okay. Why are people using them? Because they don't have the EPD. If you knew it, you wouldn't use them. If you don't know it, you're going to make the mistake. You're looking for the good and some bads coming along with it. Unfortunately, in this case, the bad is worse than the good. It's not that those bulls aren't useful bulls. I mean, they're great bulls, but those ones that have bad fertility, they're, they're just, they're going to clobber your cow herd. And the difference between what we're trying to do is we're trying to pick bulls that excel on ranch and fertility and still have a lot of merit in the feedlot. We don't want to give away the feedlot. Most of the Angus bulls are going to decrease your fertility and they're just going to chase growth in kind. That's not everybody. There are Angus breeders that are doing a great job on fertility. And some of them are enrolled in our dollar profit system. And, and these guys are, are really working on it. And, and you can find really high fertility, really high productivity Angus cattle. Still no hybrid vigor. And, and we know hybrid vigor has a big effect. So we're at the time of the, the, the presentation where I ask all of our presenters to pop off your uh, mute button, if you will. And I'm going to stop sharing, and we're going to do a little round robin on, on Q&A. And the good thing is Becky sent me some questions already, but I'm going to start out with um, I don't have any questions. with, with uh, a question to you, Doug. Um, you, you made a comment at the end I thought was really good. You said cows must fit the breed type and, and kind to their feed resources. Just, just, just. Dial in on on what the issues are if you got the wrong breed type. Oh my, that's well. We could talk quite a bit, but you know, you got the wrong type, or you you just have not given some serious thought to the uh, to that environment that you have. And, and you know, we can have that good year or maybe two when we get above average rainfall, we've got uh, a lot of forage, uh, the native pastures are growing phenomenally, and uh, and you can get lulled into the fact, well, these cows that really aren't, really are not designed for this environment, even though we got, you know, we got these, these uh, we get these aberrations, but if we look at the environment over a long period of time, for instance, in our area where it's Summers can be hot and dry or they can be moist, but generally they're more after the the first of July, we're talking thunderstorms. And that's our moisture. But we still got quite a bit of time between July, August, September, October, when we may not get much rain and those cows uh, got to support themselves off that pasture. And so if we've taken on a cow that has more frame, more weight, more, you know, just a bigger animal. And you go back to Clay Center and you look at their data and they show you very, very succinctly that there are animals that will fit certain uh, environments and do well in those environments and still be a large animal. You bring that same animal out to Western North Dakota or Wyoming or Montana, this whole, whole uh, range area, 
a lower rainfall and they, they fall apart. They yep. just fall apart. They, they won't do it. And, and we go back to this uh, fertility and we go back to not only the fertility, but their stability in the herd. They just fall out. And, and you go back to what, uh, what was said earlier and, and you, you can't get to those five calves or the seven or eight calves. And in, in the research centers herd and our data on chaps, you know, we've got some cows that got re some real serious longevity to them, but we got others that don't, they fall out. Every herd has that, but uh, matching that animal to the environment, not that extreme year, uh, no, don't do that because that's gonna come back to bite you, in my opinion. I don't know if I've answered your question, but that's the way I see it. And you go back you to the University of Wyoming did some work too with those cows. And you've probably read that data because you're close to that university. And you know, those, those larger frame cows didn't do very well. Yeah. No, we get these uh, inherent reports back and people say, well, what, what do you select for? I said, well, you make it easy and we look at the ranch index. But we can also go over and look at things we don't like and then say, here's, here's, a, here's a replacement effort we don't like. She's going to get big. She's going to get tall. She's low on back fat and she's low on fertility. <laughs> like, um, that's, that's, that's a bad bet, right? That's a bad bet. <laughs> on a five-star system, you lost on four of them. Yeah, yeah, that's a really bad bet. Caroline, I wonder if you would share while we're, well, I'm going to ask Craig a question. If you'd share that slide that showed the cost um, versus the, you know, which one I want to mean, where it hits yeah. zero at five. And then I'm going to come back and ask a question on that. Craig, I, I know that, uh, you know, we, we have a lot of people. What do you think, what do you think is a common mistake people are using when they're looking in the catalog, I mean, you've talked to a lot of different people. What, what, what do you think is that is the one most common mistake at this point that we run into? Um, I, I don't, I don't know if I have a great answer, but I, I think it's just being focused um, on, on on where you're going. I, mean, I think it, you know, there's an old saying: if you don't know where you're going, you'll never know when you get there. And and so I think that's the biggest thing. And and I think one way to do that, Lee, as you've already mentioned tonight, is to do inherent testing. If you know where your cow herd is, if you benchmark that, and you know what traits you're weak in, um, that's how you know where you need to go, go and select for bull, bull power. And so is that fair enough? Good enough answer? It's a great one. Okay. Caroline, can you back up to the one that talks about calf crop percentage versus number of calves? The, the graph one. Yeah. The, Either one, either one, both are the same. Um, I know that people look at this chart because we printed it. And they say, well, you know, I don't have any cows that only have two calves. <laughs> 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 and, and, and I, Doug, you could probably chime in as well. You guys got the chaps day. It'd be interesting to go through and see how many cows only have two calves, right, Doug? <laughs> oh, yeah, you cow. could, sure. Yeah, you could. But, I, I mean, Caroline, I, I, I think that the way we modeled this, right, was we assumed that two through eight have kind of the same percentage. And I think the thing that people lose on here is that within their herd, they have all these different kinds of cows. Yep, you're a hundred percent correct. Yeah, they they forget that they say, "Oh, I'm all gonna have five. No, some have eight, and some have two, right? And and as we, we the thing that surprised <laughs> us is now now in the database we have bulls that have had five hundred, six hundred, seven hundred dollars. Okay, and some of those bulls average two, okay? and some of those bulls average over six and it's and you, you and i don't think well, even when we got that when we got this back from you we were like oh, can we can there really be that much difference in them and and then i went and grabbed one of the high fertility bulls and, and he's sitting out there well over 90 percent 
plus three something on on his on his uh, fertility EPD. And I pulled out another heavy use bull the same born in the same year. They're both eight, seven, eight, nine year old bulls. They got a lot of daughters in the herd. And sit down here at seventy percent. And I was like, wow, wow. And now just just go over to the other deal. And, and what I'm going to ask you on this other one is why does that tail drop so low again? I just I I think all the no, way from the one the cost one, yeah. Where was that one? There it is. Yeah. So so as, as I look at this chart, if I read it right, what it says, if I have daughters that have three or less calves, so if I have a, a bull whose daughters are going in the herd and on average are only producing two or three, which means they've got a low fertility EPD, you're saying those bulls' daughters lose a ton of money. Yes. Okay. Well, say again why that is, or Nathan can dive into that. I don't you, whichever one of you wants to answer it. <laughs> so what's most important to remember is if we're only having those two calves, we're spreading those costs out just not very much at all. And so every calf is taking a huge hit. Because I wondered the same thing, because the previous graph we said the better it gets, the faster it gets better. So why is this one different? The reason is because this is per calf, not per cow lifetime. And so what we're looking at is, is by the time we get out to that six, seven, eight cows per calves per cow lifetime, we're spreading it out over more calves. And so the individual effect looks a lot smaller. But when we go towards that other end, we only have two or three calves to spread it out and they just take a huge hit. I, I think this makes sense in a way because what it says is, if you had perfect fertility, it wouldn't be a lot higher. It'd be higher, but this right. thing's going to flatten out eventually, right? Exactly. If, if, you have, if you have no calves, it's infinitely unprofitable. Exactly. And it really gets into the idea of what is, what's that marginal change once we get really high in. And if you're worrying about your increase in weaning percentage from a 95 to a 96, I'd say you're probably sitting pretty good and you can kind of choose your pick of where you want to improve. We're more talking about those people. We need to have a weaning percent higher than 87, just hands down. If your weaning percent is under 87, your cows are not staying in the herd long enough to cover that depreciation expense. They're probably not covering the cost it's taking to raise those calves, and you need to be focusing on facility to drag them up. And then once you get to that five, then you can start kind of picking and choosing your battles. We still want to increase fertility, but maybe we want to look a little bit more on some carcass characteristics or some other things. But until you can hit that five calves per cow lifetime, fertility is where you need to focus on. Yeah. Yeah, it's such a big driver, and that's that's the thing we tell people. We just we we just we're just not going to use bulls down at this end of the spectrum to produce our bulls. I don't care what else they do right. Exactly. We're going to use bulls up here, and and I think that and that has to be their strategy too. And, and kind of goes right back into those stars. And and I guess I would tie that into what you said, Doug. If they're up at this end of the fertility curve then boy, let, let's drive home. Let's figure out ways to cut that feed cost per cow. Let's stock the ranch heavier. Let's do a lot of things to improve our production per acre and, and reduce our cost per cow. Don't you think that? Well, I do. And I think one of the things is we're talking about and, and Carolyn is talking in our area, I don't know if it's a tug of war, but it's, it's a, it's a, it takes a lot of work to balance this milking ability. And milking ability is the number one driver to uh, cause cows to be infertile. I mean, if we if we don't have that milking ability under control, it is the primary. A cow will feed its calf first. We all know that it's going to take care of its infant before it takes care of rebreeding. And so, if we've got too much energy, and it's an energy relationship, and if we've got a higher energy relationship that's needed to satisfy that milking ability level in the cows that we have, we're going to, and Carolyn, to get back to that percentage that you're talking about, we've really got to work and never give up. You can't say, well, we've reached it because as soon as you do, you're going to slip back. You you're have sorry. to always have the pedal, your, your finger on the pulse of milking ability and what those, and you know, we want, if we're pushing for you know, we got the terminal crosses, but we must put our emphasis on the 
on the mother cow and the crossbred or and so forth and if we can crossbreed it's to our advantage to have that crossbred female to maximize on heterosis and their ability to continue longevity now i talked about things in my talk about kind of management things of selling cows and capitalizing on money but uh i go back to the real heart and soul of this having this high calving and uh, cows that are calving in, in you know a good 365 days and they just do it bang 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 and it's a result it all goes back to milking ability and are they able to thrive rebreed in the environment that they're situated in and and we can move from the mississippi river where the rainfall and precipitation is high and they have forages and they're you know kind of washy grasses but you move out to our country and the semi-arid region of this country, and boy, that calving, uh, that milking ability is so, so, so important. And in in re many respects, uh, Lee, the work that you're doing with the star system and your dollar, uh, your dollar uh, indexes, at the end of the day, except for the terminal crosses, at the end of the day, you're really going back to milking ability and the animal's ability to thrive within the environment with which it's situated. Yeah, yeah. And I think I think in a way, sometimes when I think about these high fertility animals and, and it surprises us, some of them, but obviously most of them are a little lower on milk, some of them are higher on milk. And, and we try to figure that out. And, and then we got to remember that, that what we measure is not how much they milked, but how heavy their calf was. Yeah, we measured in pounds, yeah. Yeah, and and that calf weight can be driven by the cow's maternal weaning weight and the cow's, uh, the calf's efficiency. If we make that calf better at using milk, better at grazing forage, we can get a little more weight out of the calf with the same amount of milk production, but the milk EPD is still going to look higher. Yeah. And and we're not so sure that that might not be going on. Now I'm into the weeds. I'm I'm going to drop back and we got some really good questions. And so I'm going to just pose those two or three, and then and then we're probably at about the the top of the hour. So let me just uh, dive in on these three questions. And the first question um, I'll ask. Well, I'll, I'll tackle the first one, Craig. You're gonna. I'll give you the first one, and I'll tackle the second one. First one says. If, if you had a preference as a cow-calf producer selling at weaning, would you focus more on profit or higher ranch when keeping replacements? Um, so I'm gonna focus on, on dollar ranch and I'm just gonna always take as much profit as I can get, but, but uh, selling at weaning, we're gonna focus on, on ranch, so. Yeah. That's the yeah. direct answer. So. Direct yes. answer, that's straightforward, yeah. And then the second question came in, and, and I'll tackle this way. He said, what do you mean when you said you're going to collect this bull for leachman use? So these young bulls, we're collecting semen on them already. Um, we'll announce at sale time and how much we have and how much we need. And uh, it's possible that those used bulls will have to stay around for, what, Craig, three or four weeks before yeah. we can get the semen we need. That'll cost us extra money. We'll have to special deliver them, but we do that every year. So that's what that's what the use is. And this year we identified them earlier. We've been collecting them already and we just put that in the catalog. So now here's a panel question, okay? Panel question, this is, this is a hard one. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, what do you think about two EPDs that we publish, one's feed intake, and the other's feed efficiency as maternal selection tools versus mature weight. I mean, this, this is a hard question. Craig, I'm, I'm going to let the other guys think about it. I'm going to ask you to, to weigh in on cow size, cow feed intake, cow efficiency. What do we really want in that, in that maternal package? I think um, I think we want cows that eat less and and um, and, and and bring more pounds in. So um, you know, I, I was really interested in letting Doug answer that question, probably, or or the people from King Ranch as well. But but anyway, you, you know, I, I think we want a moderate a moderate cow that um, you know you know that's easy keeping, easy flesh, and 
and um, and does eat less. Um, and we can get more pounds per acre. Um, we put that in our in our maternal maternal um, specialist. We want more pounds per acre, and, and like Doug was saying, we can get more um, have more cows grazing and, and get more return on our investment. So, real quickly. So, Doug, you want to go next on that? Well, <laughs> no. Let let Caroline do it. <laughs> I would just say I love a small cow that can efficiently turn feed into pounds. If you can figure that out. Uh, Doug brought up just such a great point. It's so hard to figure out, even using some great genetic EPDs, what cows are best suited for your environment because it's it's just it's dang hard. And so I might tend towards efficiency a little bit more than I would tend towards mature cow size. Nathan, what do you think? I think efficiency, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, they've got to be able to utilize whatever your management is, whatever your resources are, they got to be able to, to optimize that, the use of those resources and produce. I think we forget yep. sometimes that even though our beef is the end product and that goes through the feedlot, that without a strong maternal cow herd, we just don't get any of that product. And so the focus that we're trending towards now as an industry, especially with leachmans and the fertility, hopefully is going to remind people that having those good cows that are low cost and that can churn out the calves is really what we need. Well, Doug, you want to chime in or Nathan, you want to chime in on any of that? Well, yeah. Um, they may, everyone makes good points and I think we're all kind of on the same page, so to speak. I think as we push for that efficiency, uh, I wrote a paper, published a paper, uh, talking about uh, steers and frame size published that in the journal animals uh, you may or may not have read that but we've done quite a bit of work in this integrated systems with uh, steers uh, basically taking steer and sit, basically owning cattle from the time that they're born until they're hanging on the rail and and no middleman no interference there no buying selling or any of that nature just own them till they die on the rail and the efficiency and, and like you talked about earlier. And mm -hmm. I think it has a lot to do with, with uh, as I go back to milking ability and getting that animal to produce the amount of pounds that it can in the environment with which it is being uh, subjected to. And the size of that cow can play a role inefficiency because they're all tied together. I don't think you can totally separate them because in order to get efficiency, we've got to have animals that are able to thrive on a lower intake and yet have a, I don't know, no, no necessarily that would be above average output. But if we produce that, that animal, that cow that will milk and then outcross it, to a terminal sire is when we're going to take advantage of the cow that can thrive in the environment, but the, the, the offspring is not going to stay there, except for the replacements. Of course, they're going to stay, but that, mm -hmm. but that feeder animal is going to go to market. And it just depends. Now, I, this is just one of my personal feelings or a pet peeve is that we spend a tremendous amount of money on bulls. We breed cows. We sell calves, and I ask the question, why do you sell those calves? Why don't you capitalize on the genetics that you paid for? You paid good money, you know, seven, eight, ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars for a sire, and then you know, do some collecting on it or whatever, but why not take advantage of those genetics beyond the calf or just selling wean calves? Uh, we can yep. overwinter those. We can overwinter those steers, and at fairly uh, you know reasonable gains, so that when they go to pasture, they don't have this this lag time. If they've been pushed very hard in the feed yard, they're going to have a lag time once they get to pasture. But beyond that, I mean, we take those yearlings, and when they get to the feed yard in December, we'll graze them a couple hundred days through annual forages, native pasture, and so forth. When we hit the feed yard, they're gaining close to five pounds a day. 
and it doesn't take very long to hang high choice and a lot of prime carcasses by doing that because all the time on forages that are high quality forages you move from one kind to the next one forage type different maturity dates we're able to take and move a lot of cattle into the feedlot and into the packing plant and it never changes hands so we could run yeah. less cows and produce a lot of product yeah I, i'm always amazed i i've run through several different ranch budgets that were running yearlings um, in addition to their cows and when i took those budgets and dissected them back to selling calves at weaning that didn't work as well and i think i think so many ranchers have forgotten that as the value of corn went up the value of putting on pounds off of forage also went up and so there's there's more opportunity today to turn an the, the value of an animal unit today to put weight on a yearling is more valuable than it's ever been and I, and i'm not sure people have done that math to the to the extent they have i think great presentation tonight i mean we could i, I mean I, it's funny because i'm spinning I, i'll tell you carolina i i came to the to the institute because uh I heard Clay Mathis give a great presentation on on the marginal stocking rate and the value of that that you talked about, Doug, and how that shifts operational profitability as you do that, even selling just calves of weaning. And, and so, you know, I, you guys are all talking about things that are near and dear to us, which is how you take at the margin. How do we make these animals a little bit better? How do we save a little bit of cost? How do we get more calves per hundred cows? How do we get more pounds per acre? And this is this is what we thrive on. And uh, I, I'm very happy with the presentation today. You know, we're kind of hands off. I'll let you guys come up with what you did. And, and you guys did a great job. And um, um, we're getting a lot of, of, uh, of uh, messages pouring in on how much people are appreciating the program. So thank you very much on behalf of everybody out there. We appreciate it. We do invite you if you're if you're seeing this this presentation and you're interested in learning more please go to our website at www.leachman.com we certainly invite you if, if you're looking or listening tonight and you want to join us for our sale a, a week from monday uh, let's see a week from uh Sunday, we'll have a female sale, and that's on the 26th of March, and we'll have a prime rib, or not prime rib, I think that's going to be prime strips, steak dinner, and some Western entertainment out the barn, and then uh, on Monday morning, the 27th, we'll sell 500 of these bulls, but if you're watching this, and it's a year later, and you still say, well, I missed the sale, Craig, we have bulls for sale almost all the time, don't we? <laughs> we did, we did. Yeah. How many, how many catalogs are we going to make this year, Craig? I'm trying not to think about things like that, but probably 16 to 17. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so we all, we appreciate you all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Caroline. I want to thank the people at Superior Livestock. They help us with our broadcast. They help tonight, Chance Ludwig and, and Jason Barber and the crew um, for helping us stream this on so many platforms. Thank you all. And uh, we just uh, do hope that these ideas can help you and your family make better decisions about your ranching operation. Um, we think it's a tough business. It's hard to do well. And, and we're just trying to give people ideas to help them do better. And it's it's near and dear to our heart. We think that, that God gave us this land and these cattle and the chance to do this and do it with our families. And it's a great way of life. But we also want it to be a sustainable business. And uh, that's what we're trying to do. So thank you very much for joining us, everyone involved. Thank and. Uh, Lee, yes, could I, I just want to say thank you for the invitation to participate in your program. You bet, Doug. Yeah. Thank you. We echo that. Thank, thank you, Lee. You. All right. Okay. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye.